Uh, we're gonna go ahead and cancel the business meeting. We'll still have some breakfast. Uh, <laughs> after, yeah. So you, you don't need to listen to me at seven in the afternoon in the morning. Um, after our discussion yesterday on the future of APA with um, Cynthia Bowen, our incoming APA president, it was such a good discussion and really was um, uh, as much or more than we would cover typically in our business meetings. So I think we've sort of covered that already, and no need to. Uh, no need to rehash. Uh, really appreciate the, the conversation yesterday. Uh, as I mentioned, breakfast will still be available, so please come enjoy breakfast. I believe it'll be in this room, and then uh, we'll get the conference started. Also, uh, yesterday we had our uh, chapter board meeting and had some good good things come out of that. One in particular, we have um, decided to uh, open up uh, a new chair on the board, um, so we'll be looking to fill a communication chair, and so. Um, if you're interested, or if you know somebody who's interested, if you're a manager, and you can kind of you know, force one of your staff to uh, <laughs> volunteer and uh, you know, have some resume building, we would really appreciate that. So, um, Fred's going to be sending out an email in the uh, probably next week or so. He's our de facto communication chair, so basically he's going to uh, you know, push away some of his moves. No, just kidding. Um, no, 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 no. You got that. <laughs> uh, so, Without further ado, I want to um, I thank the city of Henderson, and I would like to at this time introduce uh, Mayor Andy Hayden, which I just met him a second ago, but I felt like I'd met you before, Mayor, because every time I go to the city's website, you come out and warn me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Mayor Hayden, if you would like to uh, welcome. Well, thank you, Andrew. And actually, we have uh, changed your website now. I don't come out anymore because I think it scared people to death. <laughs> and they didn't want to get rid of me. I'm officially the key to the camera. So it scared me. So we got a lot of mileage out of that. At some of the uh, uh, national conferences, people would come up to me and say, I know you, you're on the website. Now. And they want to know how we did it. So I explained it to them. You know, I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, this gives me a chance to brag as a mayor, and we always take that opportunity to do that. But first, let me start off with a, a couple of things about the APA here. You know, we had a, uh, a director of planning who was president of the, the National APA, and with us today is Cynthia. Thank you for coming. As a matter of fact, someone commented right there, this may be the first time that we've maybe had a, a president come to a state conference. So I don't know if that's true or not. Some people can fact check that. But thank you for being here. <laughs> And let me tell you something else, too, about the city of Henderson. <clears throat> There's five of us on the council, the mayor and three four council members, and I just realized that of the five council members, I'm the only one that didn't serve on the planning commission. <laughs> and it has changed over the years. By the way, I, I'm in my 30th and final year. Uh, with term limitations, I'll be gone in the spring. But I don't know how anybody can serve effectively on the council without having a little bit of planning experience nowadays. Uh, you know, 30 years ago, it was kind of like on-the-job training. And, and matter of fact, uh, I was discussing with uh, Stephanie, our, our planning director, that you know what? I put myself on uh, the city council liaison to the planning commission on purpose. So I sat in on every single planning commission meeting, and I think that has been a really big help to me. And, that, and my uh, uh, time in office. <clears throat> you know, another thing too, I told you I've been here a long time, but so I am the last of the last on the council now when uh, Nevada State College became uh, a Henderson partner, if you will. And I want to, uh, to give a shout out to President Patterson. We have such a great relationship with the State College. A great corporate partner. I see Bart, he probably he goes to more places than I do, but everywhere I seem to go, I mean, I see Bart, a member of the chamber, just engaged with the community. And so my hat's off. And, and no disrespect to you know, other uh, institutions of higher learning in the state of Nevada, but we really are proud to have Nevada State College in our corporate boundaries. And you know, some 14 years ago now, uh, Nevada State College got its start. Our population was about 206,000 in the city of Henderson, and I believe we started out with, if I've got my facts correct here, 177 students. In a vitamin factory, literally, down the road here, that uh, 
this was supposed to be kind of a, a city industrial area, industrial park area. And so the Lion and Pac Man, in fact, Andrew Westman, if some of you see him on the, uh, the shopping channel, uh, that's where he, he first had his, uh, his building here in Henderson, and he's moved to a different location still in Henderson. But that was the very first start for the, the college. And so now, fast forward 14 years, and we have three beautiful buildings. Uh, 500 acre campus that we went through literally an act of Congress to get. And we're looking very, very forward to this panel here today and talking about the master plan for the college in the next 20 years. Because, not in the last 14 years, again, if I were right, Nevada State College is about 3,500 students, and the population of Henderson is almost 300,000. And in our planning document, if I've got it right, Stephanie, 20 years from now, we're planning on being a city of 400,000 residents. And I'm going to be bold, I'm going to be great, I'm going to be state, because I predict that Nevada State College will probably be around 15,000, 20,000 student population, which will be nearing, I, I believe, I'm sure you know, we will we'll grow some too and say with CSN, but we'll be right there in the mix. And, we have some of the best students in the whole state, Mr. President. <clears throat> you know, and so, as we're here today, and of course you've been to, to this conference, but this panel, as I told you, is very important to me. I thought about this this morning, actually, we're talking about grandkids at our table. So 20 years from now, it's going to be my grandchildren, all these grandchildren's generation, that are going to be the presidents of the colleges and the planning directors and the mayors and the councils. And we're setting the stage here now. And I look back 20 years to where we were in, say, 1996 and see where we are today. We look forward to another 20 years from now. And I mark my words, I know we're going through a lot of political turbulence at this time, but this nation is a great nation. Nevada is a great state, and Henderson is a great community, and Nevada State College is a great college. And that's where it is today, and it's only going to get bigger and better 20 years from now, just like our college. So when I've got my, my cane and I come to city council meetings, or up here at the college, I'm shaking at you guys, I will have this really sweet spot in my heart knowing that it's going to work correctly. And I can try to see if they can make it. And so with that, I don't know if I'll come back to you, Andrew, or somebody else. Thank you very much. And for you, uh, for your state members from the, the north or outside of Henderson, as every mayor would say, spend all your money here while you're here. Please do that for us. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And it's, I, actually, I go by Andy, so, I, yeah, I appreciate it, Andy. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I really appreciate your, your words, and um, I've shared, I, you know, I'm a local Las Vegas kid, I now live in, in Reno, and so over the years, you know, I, I, I grew up on the other side of the valley. Um, so didn't spend so much time in Henderson, and, and having spent time here over the last few years, it is just a beautiful city. Um, you can tell the good work uh, that has gone into planning it and the, the beautiful growth. And also want to thank the city of Henderson. They have been a tremendous partner for the Nevada Chapter of American Planning Association for many, many years. Um, down to you know their staff and the support and participation. Um, Councilwoman March has been uh, a very steadfast supporter of the, of the APA, um, even down to allowing Craig Toth when he was uh, in 2008 when he hosted the national uh, conference here in Las Vegas, that you know allowing him to uh, be the chair of that. You know, that's a that's definitely a big commitment on the part of the city, we really appreciate that. Um, okay, now I would like to introduce our panel um, that will be sharing with us about uh, the Nevada State College Master Plan. Um, joining us today will be President Bart Patterson, who's the Nevada State College uh, President. Uh, and also, uh, I'm not gonna share bios, there are in your packets, so uh, for more information on these, please refer to your packets. Um, Stephanie Garcia Boss, who's the Director of Community Development and Services uh, for the City of Henderson. Cam Walker is the Director of Business Development <coughs> for and Councilman for Boulder City. And then moderating for us um, today, and I'll turn the mic over to John Huck, and, uh, anchor with Fox 5 Henderson. So please join me in welcoming our panel. Hi everyone, thanks for having us out. 
This is a, a nice distraction from uh, the debate tomorrow. <laughs> I'm going to be spending 12 hours in the Thomas and Mac in what they call the spin room. And just to give you an idea of how aggressively they try to spin the media, last debate, I won't identify the party because I want to keep it nonpartisan, but last debate we got an email saying, our candidate won the debate. And that email came an hour before the debate even started. <laughs> So this is going to be a nice little distraction. Thanks for having me out. And if any time I ask a question and someone says, hey, I, you know, I want to jump in, just jump in. You know, we'll keep it loose, and then we're going to open up for Q&A um, in about a half hour or so, whenever we get to do questions. So I want to talk first about the master plan for Nevada State College. So I guess I'll address the first question to Bart. I recently rolled out the master plan for NSC. So tell us a little bit about what the vision is going forward. Uh, thank you, uh, John. And so, um, we're obviously a very young institution. We're one of the the, uh, the youngest institution in, in the country. Uh, one of the few uh, four-year public colleges that started uh, in the 2000s. And so, um, we have our own trajectory to follow. And um, I be I became president about five years ago. I'm going to celebrate my fifth anniversary on November 1 uh, of this year. And uh, in four more months, I'll be the longest serving president in college history. So it tells you a little bit about our trajectory. Um, and uh, we've, we've had seven presidents. Um, the other president obviously also served uh, over five years. And so between the two of us, that's almost all of the history of college. Um, but there were many, many important players along the way. Uh, one of the, the critical things that we did is in working with the city, uh, develop a master plan uh, for the college. And uh, in a fair amount of detail, if you've ever had a chance to look at it, uh, I think the document as a whole is over 200 pages, um, complete with all kinds of uh, charts and pictures. And, uh, but the, the broadest part of that is the vision of what we want the college to be. You know, we have a really unique opportunity um, that many colleges have never had which is to design something from the ground up and to design sort of the, uh, as we we're fond in academia of saying, the town-gown relationship, meaning just basically how do you work with your city. We have a chance to design that on the front end. Very unusual. All you have to do is drive down Maryland Parkway and look the other side from UNLV and you recognize they didn't really have that <laughs> opportunity. That's not exactly uh, the synergy that they want between, would want it between the university and the surrounding area. And so there are all kinds of challenges now associated with them trying to redraw that or recreate that. We don't have that. So the master plan was designed to provide those guiding principles in working with the city and the additional approximately 100 acres they have around us uh, to really create something unique in terms of a long-term vision. And that vision is built on things like sustainability. It's built on creating this active learning environment and, and taking advantage of the desert environment we have. Um, it, it's built on those concepts uh, that are going to be important going forward as a society. Uh, that is, how do we use energy consumption? Um, how, how do we um, fit in with the environment in which uh, we're created? How do we build buildings to maximize learning potential? How do we create space and, and buildings that um, maximize kind of multifunctionality uh, in a constrained budget environment. Those are all the kinds of things that I would talk about when I talk about the uh, vision. And the sustainability, is that more for managing expenses or is that a, a teaching tool for the kids here, the students here? It, it's absolutely both. So uh, we started out in sort of baby steps in that direction. Both of these buildings uh, were designed to, uh, to lead standards. I think the, the uh, LAS building was as well. Um, and then we obviously we have a demonstration solar project, which provides about a third of the power um, for uh, the LAS building. And we also use that as sort of a teaching tool in terms of how the solar energy work and sort of the economics behind that. Um, so it's kind of both. And, and obviously that's going to become increasingly uh, important uh, in, in our society to really pay attention to the overall cost of things, not just for the individual development, but also that impact on um, the environment, which has a cost associated with it. I think this would be a good opportunity to bring Cam Walker into this. LEDCOR completed the Nursing, Science, and Education Building, the Student Activities and Administration Building, and the Central Plan for Nevada State College. 
So I guess the same question to you, Ken, knowing the makeup of the student body, who are typically older than most student bodies, how did that influence your design of these buildings and the campus? Thank you, and yes, I'll answer that, but I think Stephanie, the mother of the master plan, <laughs> for those of us who know, needs to answer the last question when I'm done, just uh, so you're aware. Um, it is important to note, for those of you who are not aware, is the state has only built half a building, maybe less than half a building here. So the city of Henderson, the college, has really taken it upon themselves to figure out unique ways to fund education when the state hasn't had the resources to step up and do it. Um, so that's important to note when you look at the master plan, you look at what's gone on. These two buildings were originally started as a P3 project. Um, the developer who um, we were a part of the team um, had a, a, a rich environment where they were going to make a little more than the state really saw appropriate. Uh, so naturally the state took it upon themselves to use the student tuition uh, and additional um, revenues that they were leasing buildings to build these buildings without any money from the state. So I applaud BART and the college for doing that. Uh, we did design it to those standards. We did have the long-term vision in place. Um, we do have to go through Henderson's approval process when it comes to that, looking at the integrity of that partnership between the state and the city um, as far as the uh, building of the project here. Um, but what it really does is it turns the attention to the future. Um, and we can talk about that a little more because BART really does have a vision for where this is going to go. And you have to if you're going to plan for 10 or 15,000 uh, students here in a short order. Of, um, when you look at 12% growth rate in a year and you look at already out of space uh, before the buildings even came online. Yeah, we'll certainly get to that, what's going forward. But, so you are the mother of the master plan. <laughs> I'm not sure that I should wear that. Thank you, Pam. It's probably a memory that's going to stick, too. But, um, you know, it was interesting when you asked about the master plan, and I guess in my head, I think of the current master plan because the master plans have evolved. Just as there have been seven presidents, I think there have probably been seven or more ideas about what the master plan should look like. And the city has been really intentional and thoughtful in the planning, and rarely do we have an opportunity to really plan for a college. Just as UNLV evolved on Maryland Parkway, everything else evolved around it. But here, we've been very intentional about what we want to see. And um, originally, we had entered into a college area plan. So there's a college area plan that the city did, and we had advisory groups, and Councilwoman Jerry Schroeder, who's in the audience, was a planning commissioner then. And I remember being in the vitamin building uh, and having really contentious meetings with the neighborhood out here about what a college could look like. There was a metro officer who lived just on the other side of the railroad tracks who, his beat was around UNLV, and he would come to the meetings and share what it was like patrolling that area and why he didn't want a college in his neighborhood. And so some of the decisions that were made about transportation and integration networks are because of some of that, but the first meetings were really happily contentious, and the college wasn't going to come here because of what people thought a college would bring. Why did he get pushed back from the community? What were the reasons they gave? Okay, so everybody in here has been to college. I don't know what your college more than is. Once. Uh, okay. More than once, that's probably a good thing. Um, I don't know what your college campuses were like, but I went to a sort of a rowdy kind of a college where there was a lot of noise, um, lots of smells sometimes, you know, after Thursday or Friday night, maybe Saturday night, uh, a lot of people making noise into the wee, wee hours. Um, there's, there's a little bit of a stigma that comes with a college student. I think, let's see, in terms of planning, it might be college students, affordable housing, uh, let's see, any project that's in my backyard. Yeah. Um, so college students don't necessarily have that connotation of, oh, they're going to be peaceful and uh, be great neighbors, especially when there's 500 acres of vacant land in their backyard. So when we did our college area plan, we thought about what the uses were going to be on the city side of the land, and, Maybe we'll talk about that later, but the reason why it really struck me as saying the current college plan, because we had thought we'd gone through this process and wanted to see this integration, and then the college president, maybe six presidents ago, had a completely different vision. And the first campus was up on the hill and would have required you to walk you know, from some planned transit probably a half a mile uphill. I don't know that anyone would do that in the desert. So um, when we think of the current college plan, the city partnered, and we actually paid to be a partner, to make sure we had a seat at the table, because we knew that a college campus in the city of Henderson 
would be great for us. Great cities have great colleges. Great cities have great education. This is a piece that was missing. And, and so it also, cities have had universities and colleges. They also have a talent pool for jobs that come up and down the road. Was that thinking in opening Nevada State College? Most definitely. If you go back to why we're here today, uh, 20 years ago, our economic development strategy was to attract institutions of higher learning. And we did that. We have Nevada State College here. We have Turo. We have Roseman. We have 12 different universities here on, in the city. Um, so it was definitely part of our economic development strategy. Education has always been important to Henderson residents. When we did the most recent Southern Nevada Strong survey and polled the entire community of Las Vegas Valley, economic development or economic competitiveness was the most important. But if we pulled out Henderson residents, education was the top issue. And so education, a great quality school, the middle tier of schools, if you will, between the UNRs, UNLVs, and the College of Southern Nevada, we needed another institution. And if you think back to when this college campus was approved, we were having high growth. We couldn't find teachers. Do you remember there were billboards at the airports trying to recruit teachers from other parts of the country? And so this college is really founded in trying to meet those needs here of, of our community, we make teachers, nurses. Does the city keep any kind of data on how many alum it recruits from Nevada State College? Uh, the city of Henderson in terms of staff? We I guess staff. I mean, I guess, I, mean, I guess it would be unreasonable to expect small businesses in Henderson to keep that kind of information, but just as the city being the main, one of the main employers here. We, we may have that data, but aren't we also have that data to know where his students are being employed? Yeah, thank you. So uh, we're collecting more and more of that information all the time, so I can't give you some uh, specific numbers yet on, on how many of the students go right back into Henderson, but just an example of the idea of the collaboration. So many of um, the, uh, the folks in the uh, Henderson Police have gone through, went through the law enforcement program, and that was really a direct partnership with the city. Uh, to create that. And I think as we get start to expand, we will we will graduate more and more students, not just in uh, nursing education, we have the largest nursing program in the state uh, for bachelor's program larger than UNR and UNLV to show an idea of how we build out. We'll do that in education. But it'll be in other programs that will even directly benefit the city. Our business program is very large. We're putting out lots of students that are going to any businesses here. And uh, things like uh, bringing online public administration or public policy type of degree, ultimately, that I'm sure that will build at the college and will have some direct impact on, on the city. Uh, so there are multiple degree pathways that we'll have to see. And how would you, what would you say is NSC's unique marketing position and how do you differentiate it from all the different schools in Nevada? Gosh, you know, I'm going to keep this really positive. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so um, in, in terms of how we fit in, we are that middle tier, as Stephanie said, of an education system. So if you think of uh, California, you have the universities of California that are research-focused institutions. That's what UNLV and UNR are aspiring to be, is research-focused institutions. Uh, then you have a middle tier, which is the Cal State University system. And so all of the Cal States are much more intentional about being teaching and professional degree focused as opposed to research institutions. We are intended to be a Cal State. So as we grow out, we're less expensive to the student and to the state for the cost of education. And we have much, we hire faculty to teach, not to research. Uh, although many have excellent research credentials. Um, and so our class sizes are in that 25 to 30 range. And they're taught by uh, doctorally qualified faculty. Uh, this isn't the type of institution where you come and you're going to be taught by a graduate assistant and be in a large lecture hall of 100 or 200 people. Uh, we don't have a classroom that's bigger than 40. So you are going to get a small classroom experience. And it's very important for the students that we receive because we receive so many first generation students, first in their family, to go to college. And they need that kind of hands on attention uh, in order to be successful in college. So we talked about the first generation. But looking at the demographics of the student body, can you describe what a typical student here might look like to the people in this room? Uh, absolutely. Uh, so our typical student would uh, either be right out of high school or 35 years old or older, <laughs> coming back into school for the first time. Very bimodal population. We have just as many students that are first time freshmen out of high school or in that typical college range of, of 17 to 24. Uh, we have uh, just as many students that are, that are in that sort of 30 and over range. So as you start with that kind of interesting population, it's definitely going to be a woman. 
uh, because 75% of our students are women. Uh, it's the highest percentage in the state, one of the highest for a non-women's college in the nation, uh, maybe the highest. Um, and then if you also look at the student population, we are now 60% um, diverse. Uh, in, the, in the freshman class and classes that are coming in, 60% uh, are declaring race and ethnicity diversity. So uh, our average GPA has steadily climbed, so our average GPA was a 2.99 in this freshman class. We have just as many students coming to us over a 3.5 as below a 2.5, because our entering standard is only a 2.0. So it tells you a lot about the dynamics of the institution, how it's growing, and uh, the relative quality that's really growing at the institution as well. I'm very proud of that. And Kevin, how do you design buildings for students that are a little bit older? Because they don't have the same priorities as younger students. They don't, perhaps they aren't looking for those common areas of like hacky sack or whatever. They're looking more and more at this grounding. And correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think I am. I'm not, as, I'm not really worried about that. I'm worried about building the building. Yeah. They just need it because they're overflowing. Uh, when you have classroom sizes like uh, President Patterson says, when you have uh, the opportunity to grow with the campus that you have behind us, um, you really just need to figure out how as quickly as possible to build, and that's why you know, working with Kevin Butler from the finance side of, of the college is really figuring out where we go from here and how quickly we can get it done. And what, going from here, what's Life Corps' role going to be in future expansion plans? Well, thank you, uh, and, and we went through about a two-year process. Yeah, it was really quick. Um, but they went through a process similar to UNLV, and they did a request for information. Um, so I'm part of a team that um, one of eight re responded and was awarded under 338 of NRS to um, assist as their program manager to determine how to look at the P3 environment and bring online student housing, which will allow for out-of-state students to start looking at Nevada State, also international students. Um, and student housing, uh, in a population like this, there should be the ability to get 300 beds um, is what we're looking at right now. Um, and then following that, with the diversity of the population, like Bart said, the number one thing that the students want is child care. Mm -hmm. So we have to determine how that can play into the master plan and how quickly that can come online and help. Um, and then, uh, as some of you might know, they put in for a new education building. Um, and they already have six million dollars to go towards that and they want the state to help. Again, they've never built a building for Nevada State College and they've done it. Uh, and so it's, it's a warranted uh, for what they're trying to do. Uh, we're trying to figure out how to use the 500 acres, leverage the public sector and the private sector, um, and develop a mechanism similar to, I, I talked about UNLV before, UNR did student housing with Balfour Baby under a P3 environment. We're trying to keep examples from around the state and determine how best to act as that program manager, dealing with infrastructure and those other needs, and then bring the other leasehold uh, partners on board to get a bill as quickly as possible. So let's talk about the public-private initiatives that uh, you just alluded to, and I'll address this both with Bart and Stephanie. Tell us a little bit about it and what regulatory challenges there are bringing those two together. So I'm just going to mention something on the last piece, though. But if you look at the way, if you have a chance to look around these buildings, the way it was intentionally designed is a lot of collaborative space. So um, students that come here, and uh, particularly uh, students that are, are even if students are non-traditional, they come here. They want to go to class. They want to need, need uh, time to meet with um, their their colleagues and engage in some peer mentoring and study groups and that, and then they they go. Uh, the first time freshmen come and want to stay, and so they're looking for more activity. So you have to build a college with this multifunction kind of, of uh, concept. The library itself has, you know, I was like going to show it first for the shock value of showing a library with no books. Um, but then after the initial shock is over, it's the largest digital only uh, library in the state, as long as you get an internet connection. So the key for that, particularly for a non-traditional student, is they don't have to come to campus to get that experience. They can do that from anywhere, but yet there's all of that collaborative space. So in terms of the uh, building out the 509 acres, again, it's really a unique opportunity. One of the significant issues we have is the lack of infrastructure on this parcel. Another is the grade, which you can probably see the, the exposure this creates 
for dramatic views on the, on the valley also creates issues for particularly water pressure and, and those kinds of things. But I'll let Stephanie take the first crack of kind of talking about uh, the partnership and the regulatory part, and then I'll play clean up. So the regulatory environment is, uh, it could potentially be challenging, but you know what? We've always had a pioneering spirit with Nevada State College. We've always tried to figure out how to make this happen, and the city's been behind it since the beginning. We're the ones who basically figured out where the land would be, found the parcel, went to Congress to ask for the parcel, surveyed it, did all that. And so when we first went to the Board of Regents to say, we're here to help, they actually didn't want to talk to us because the Board of Regents can do what they want. Um, they could say, this is our land, we don't want to come and talk to you. And so it took a lot of trust building, actually, to say, we really do want to partner with you, we want something great together, but we can only achieve together. So in the Campus Master Plan, um, there are locations or there's criteria, there's design guidelines that say those co traditional college buildings will go through the normal Board of Regents process. That means they don't come to the city of but they have to meet certain criteria and design guidelines because remember back to the neighbors, the noise, the types of impacts that they're concerned about. But then the traditional development that happens out here in conjunction with the campus, that would come back through our mayor and council who've always been supportive. Now, some of you may or may not realize that there's an actual tax increment financing district that uh, we can create out here at Nevada State College. And why that's important goes to Cam's conversation that the state has not built a building for Nevada State College. So back to the pioneering spirit, we've been supportive of saying the taxes generated on the land that's outside of the car campus can be re reinvested into college campus buildings. And so it's an interesting, you know, it's an interesting partnership that we're here and we're supportive saying we're going to take that tax that would have been generated and gone to other public services, but we recognize the importance of this of this institution. Uh, okay, so I think that's a good recap. So, um, so the situation is, is that we have a master plan for um, about 340 acres for a 25,000 student campus. So we're going to beat you 15,000, go up 10, but it's going to be a long time frame. So we think we'll have a, a pretty similar trajectory to UNLV in terms of it took them about 50, 60 years to build out to uh, over 20,000 student so, level. You essentially want to triple the size of the student body, correct? Uh, it will be more than triple the size of the student body, yeah. yeah. And how do you go about doing that? <laughs> well, you know, it's like the old adage, you take, you know, one bite at a time, basically, of the apple. So, um, we're, I intend very uh, steady growth pattern. Um, we, we were a, a little bit higher this last year than I anticipated. Um, I think our, our total growth was a little over 5%. Uh, we'd like to stay in that sort of 2 to 4% um, increase. Uh, because that allows us to continue to build our quality uh, and, and focus on the student experience while we're doing that. Uh, but we had kind of a crazy dynamic in this last year, just this last year. Our first time freshman population uh, and first time transfer students full time, the students that came to us full time, either as transfers or as freshmen, was up 18%. So if that on a consistent basis is probably the manageable. So, uh, then we continue to get the word out uh, about the college, and we have a huge marketing budget, uh, but I think people are having a good experience here, and that's your best marketing, is when your students go back out into their community and to their families and say, you really should check out Nevada State. And so, so far that's worked for us without a huge uh, marketing budget. Uh, but on that, on that two, um, roughly 340 acres, we still have another 170 acres beyond that, uh, and you know, if we plan this right, we probably don't need all 340 even for 25,000 students. 340 is exactly the same size as UNLV's current campus. And so you can think how spread out that is and, uh, and how that was designed. And, and so uh, the point is, is we have a couple hundred acres that can be used in public-private partnerships to build out the campus and create revenue to the college, not just to the tax increment district, but through ground lease revenues and other partnerships that we build. So that's really the future of how to develop some non-state revenue in the college that will help us grow out uh, bigger student populations, more critical need academic programs. And earlier, Ken mentioned the infrastructure issues. Can you elaborate on those when you start to build out here? Yeah, uh, we the this building here is right on the edge of the next um, zone for water. And so the city of Henderson with Jericho Heights that's being built on the top of the hill um, over by the freeway, um, there's a real need to figure out how to put probably a three to six million dollar tank on the side of the hill and plan for the next pressure zone. 
Um, that's not going to happen right away. Uh, we know that the development we're looking at and the projects we're looking at really can't um, put it that much money into infrastructure and also warrant their development projects from the public and the private sector that we're looking at. So uh, again, we figure that there's probably more like 12 million. Uh, you guys probably all drove in. Some of you drove in this morning. You got stopped in the traffic out of wagon wheel. So that happens on a regular basis. Um, if you ask Kevin, they need 400 more parking spaces <coughs> right now um, because of the way the increased demand is. Um, but you know, Stephanie and Henderson is have an open door. We're having conversations. Uh, if question five passes, the indexing of, of uh, the gas tax, then we continue to get improvements from Henderson. Wagon wheel will be looked at um, very carefully as far as how it's gonna accommodate the increased demand there. Uh, the other unique thing from a planning perspective is there's no access from college. So that was part of the master plan. There's no access from that off-ramp. So everyone has to come up here and then with the highway being built, they closed the off-ramp that was up above that you could sneak in um, from our side. So now it's all wagon wheel and we're seeing that impact. So there's a lot of infrastructure needs that have to be planned and the state you know, is looking at ways to fund. Well, let me ask you this. With the passing of this NFL stadium, NDOT identified almost a billion dollars in road projects that need to now be sped up ahead of the completion of the uh, stadium. How will that affect uh, what do you guys have planned here? Because now you're going to have to compete, won't you, for this end on funding? That's a whole other thing. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and I do sit on the convention center board, the board and the board. I understand that, but I, I don't think it will. And the mayor and Henderson understands, and each of our jurisdictions do. You know, we get some resources to allocate in our communities where we have needs. That was all planned for. It was in the plan, the tip. Um, those $899 million worth of improvements. Yeah, it's going to change priorities for the short term, but I believe this is a major priority for the city of Henderson, and it's going to continue to be, um, so there'll be those resources to figure out how to get it done. If I could just add to that quickly, I mean, obviously the I-11 project is moving through here. So the other thing you need to think about in terms of how can we incrementally tie off on existing projects that are going to come through. Um, and, and you do have to, this is the hardest part, is that, you know, in this state, it's not like, unlike any other, um, that, you know, you have these long-term plans, and oftentimes we just incrementally build out to meet the immediate need, and then it ends up costing us more down the road when we try to then readjust everything uh, to meet a longer-term need. But, you know, certainly the college is going to build out in such a way is that, you know, there may very well be a, a sports teams out here and, a, and potentially not a football stadium, don't get the neighbors warned. Potentially <laughs> some smaller basketball events type of arena is very possible here. And so uh, we need to start thinking, and we're going to need to think about traffic flow in terms of the I-11, the different interchange possibilities, and how that builds builds out. And we are thinking about those things as we design the campus in terms of what, what if the orientation changes when it comes in from the kind of the northeast uh, instead of uh, from the, the the Northwest. And Stephanie, has the community embraced the idea of NSC expanding going forward? Yeah, I think so. The community, in terms of, well, I should say, let's see, our mayor and council have been very supportive, and uh, I think that you'll find support from the chamber, the business community, because they realize the connection to you know, a well-trained workforce is part of economic development. And so we need to have people who are educated who can really be a part of that workforce. Now, the campus, you know, the master plan, the campus, I would like to say, you know, we started off with really contentious meetings, but in the last few years, it's really evolved. They've been supportive. Um, you know, one of our planners in the audience, Sean Robertson, we used to send him to the meetings and we knew it would be a little contentious, and now he goes and they're, out, they're sort of best buds now. So they, they chat, they, they hug, they say thank you for the information, so I think there's support to seeing the campus grow. And education is important, but so is culture, and that brings us to this question for you, Bart. Uh, how did it come that NSC had such a huge public art collection? Wow, uh, Angela that's uh, sitting there in, in the back could never answer this question. So really, it's thanks to her, and that's probably the, that's all I need to say. But uh, by the way, okay. Angela will be leading the uh, the group on an art tour after lunch at two o'clock. Okay, great. Thank you uh, for that. Um, so. 
Um, part of what we're trying to create as the experience for students, and, and you see this in the, in the K-12 system sometimes, that um, this student population is first generation, and you're low income. Um, oftentimes, for whatever reason, they end up at schools that maybe are subpar in terms of facilities. So one of the things that we're trying to create is to show the students that come here that they are going to be at a top-notch facility, and arts and culture is part of that. I mean, it's part of how you set the environment for a campus and you set the expectation of academic success as your surroundings. And I think it's undersold, but it's very important. So when we started designing these buildings, one of the first things we talked about is creating a small budget uh, for the arts and having art located throughout the buildings. Uh, when I say small budget, it was not enough to buy more than a couple pieces. So um, we're pretty resourceful, particularly Angela. And so all of this art that you see is local. It's local artists, many of whom have donated or are um, uh, letting us borrow their works. Um, so far, I'm not have asked for a back, so that's good. Um, and a few pieces we purchased, and a few pieces have been um, donated or provided by the foundation. But all of it's local, that was part of our, our emphasis. And then the campus itself is very involved in deciding what art goes in their area. So the School of Education is involved in, in projects that are associated with art, and our students are involved in those projects. And uh, that's true of in the types of performances that we offer at the college and all kinds of things. So it's been very a very new experience for the college to put resources in, in this area, and I feel like it's been very rewarded by the students. Well, I have to say this has been very enlightening to someone who just sees NSC when he's mountain biking by or taking the dogs out. I, I love this area of town, and I think it, it's great what you're doing to develop even more, you know, people who can contribute to Henderson going forward. So it's 1.30 now, folks, so we're going to open it up to Q&A. So I don't think this room is that big, so if you have a question, stand and, and be heard. if you look at this area, um, there really isn't any groceries available unless you count the convenience store, which does have some groceries down at, at uh, the, the, um, the freeway. Um, we just kind of started the food services this last year when we opened these new buildings. It's going pretty well. They have the capability to expand. So uh, from a food services standpoint, in terms of like a meal plan and those kinds of things, we think we can largely accommodate um, this facility with some improvements uh, with our existing food services operation. In terms of grocery stores and those kinds of things, that, those are the examples where you get really creative with public-private partnerships. So part of the student housing um, uh, plan may be, for example, to have a, a small grocery store or convenience store. I would, I would be shocked if, if proposers didn't come in with that kind of concept uh, as a potential. Uh, the other option is, of course, with the city, uh, we, we would hope that at some point this area in front of us, may, you know, maybe that is one of the uses for a small grocery store uh, for that land, which would have some synergy with the surrounding community and with the campus. And like everything that we do, we think of as being a community facility as well in general. Uh, to give you an example of that, when we talked about building out, um, like having a workout gym, um, we talk about, well, can we get a 24-hour fitness in here, or a gym, or, or a Las Vegas Athletic Club to come in and be a community facility, but we provide some of the revenue to make it economically viable. So our students and faculty just share the, the uh, facility with the community rather than do what every college and university does, which is build their own and it's exclusive to their own student population. That's the most expensive way to do things, and it doesn't engage you with the community. So we're trying to think not just about housing, but everything that we do more in that kind of shared with the community kind of facility concept. Anybody else? I think I can 
can't do without the microphone, thank you. <laughs> uh, as you know, there has been a lot of discussion about the development down here. Uh, long, long ago, with another hat on, I attended a lot of meetings with Sean and other people about this. What you're talking about in the campus is something you've been able to do yourself, an innovative way to finance. What about the fact that the new development requires private people to come in and, and actually build that out? How are you working with that possibility? Well, the great thing about that is the city of Henderson owns about 95 acres. Most of the land that you see north of this campus is uh, owned by the city of Henderson. So we have the opportunity to continue to be intentional in terms of what we approve if we go out to an RFP. We, we specifically not put it on the market. People come approached us wanting to do housing, wanting to do uses out here. I think we even had a Walmart distribution center. We had all sorts of, uh, or a Walmart, different things that have come up over time. And we've been really um, strict saying, no, we want to see, we want supportive uses to the college and we want to create this community here where the town and town experience can really be had. So you're right, Bruce, in that um, if it's privately owned, they can go do whatever they want, but we are in a unique opportunity and situation to really do an RFP that says this is what we're looking for. Uh, so any, any timing on that, Stephanie? Um, the timing is, we're, it's probably getting close to see what we want to do. I you know Ken's been in the office, Tyler, <laughs> uh, pass it down to him. Uh, they seem ready to go, and I think they were energized recently by uh, some opportunities, and so we're looking forward to, to that, but I'll pass it to Ken. Just to add quickly to that, I mean, if somebody came, and again, I'm not saying that the timing is right for this type of development, but if somebody came to us and said, Look, we can, or in the city, so we could build like a the district kind of concept coming into this college. Would I jump on that? Absolutely, I would jump on that. That would be a kind of environment to create. Uh, the ASU, for example, has been able to create on Mill Avenue, but way after the fact, and again, very expensive in order to create that once the existing developments are already in place. But those, that's the kind of thing that I have in my head. And that's the kind of thing I get to execute. <laughs> um, but I but I just got to um, give accolades to Henderson and what Stephanie's saying because when you look at the campus today comparative to 10 years ago, you wouldn't think to have a seven lane road in front of it that goes to nowhere because it stopped at this end. And I was sharing that with the mayor, having that discussion with Stephanie from a planning perspective, having been a planner myself and, and talking to Sean, is, how do we change the dynamic and make sure the dialogue is there? Um, because likewise, we'd rather not just see an RFP go out for 20 acres across the street. Um, it would be better for us to figure out how to, to marry the experience from when you get off a wagon wheel to you hit the railroad tracks and know you're on campus. Because that's a focal point to both sides of the road. So when you think of it from a larger perspective like Bart is and Stephanie is, um, and help the elected officials to understand where does the campus start and stop? You need to have a differentiating point to that so they understand they're on campus now. But right now, there's not a point to that because of the way that Hershey's Kiss is, um, as I call it. Uh, but with the changes on wagon wheel, with the railroad now going to be coming over the hill with I-11 um, and having a potential stop in that area, um, with that being the one entry point because you can't go here and there's nothing over here with I-11 in, we really have to rethink that. And that means an RFP isn't the right way to go, it's a partnership and figuring out what goes where and how we break it apart instead of put on an RFP and wait for the next 10 years for it to happen. That's what can happen in this environment. We need to see things uh, pick up and move and Henderson has showed an acceptance to help us in that environment. Because going this way costs us money, lots of money. Going that way doesn't cost Henderson money, but it creates tax revenue. So we have to bridge that balance and work together on how to do that in a methodical and a planned out way. Anybody else? Any questions? 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 What questions, maybe suggestions? You mentioned you guys have a great demographics. I did want to comment, you guys have really great demographics. Well, some target population issues, people being back and forth. 
Um, but what I wanted to get to is you mentioned a need for a daycare. Is there any possibility of integrating like early childhood resources and to open that up on campus with the possibility of using that for education? Yeah, absolutely. So as part of our, and you know, again, budget, state budget picture is pretty difficult. Um, there's a lot of, um, you know, growth in K-12, higher education, prisons, free, um, uh, Medicaid expansion. There's a lot of demands on the state budget picture with the revenue projection. It's not flat, but it's not going to meet all of those demands. So we don't know ultimately what the budget's going to look like. But one of our requests for an enhancement was some funding to start off early childhood education, and it was absolutely to partner with child care. Uh, now, we need to probably start that child care program faster than uh, will take us to get off the ground with an early childhood program, but absolutely you're right on, on track with the way we think is that we want to build a, a learning, living, lab environment, and we can do that by having child care paired up with early childhood education. Anybody else? I think I have to speak right into it to get the actual effect. <laughs> Keep it a little closer. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to compliment the marketing um, piece that I've seen so far. Even though you said far that you have a small marketing budget, could you talk a little bit about um, your, how you do your marketing? Do you have in-house um, marketing or do you consult and do you have any specialty um, competencies to continue to uh, resonate with some of our diverse uh, communities in, in the region? Yeah, okay, so let's see, how do I start with that? So we have, we do have outside um, marketing contracts, uh, more for the media buy, but also the design. Uh, we also have a, a limited public relations kind of contract. We have a fairly small marketing staff, but it's bigger than it was because we didn't have any. So uh, now we have at least two. <laughs> so we're, we're building out uh, incrementally in that way. So um, we had a, a kind of interesting approach to begin with. It's pretty expensive, uh, no offense to the television stations, it's pretty expensive to advertise on TV. And so we haven't had the budget to do much in that direction or in the newspapers. So uh, when I first came in, we had a very purposeful plan to basically go out to as many events as possible. <laughs> So not only do I want to stay connected uh, to the community as many ways as possible, but it's all of our obligations as college uh, officials to get out in the community because it's part of our marketing plan, to be quite frank. And so um, that, that was part of just getting elevating your, our attention in the community. Uh, in terms of materials, um, we do go outside to prepare some of the materials. We do hire outside for graphic design. Um, at some point, we may bring that in. We have a videographer, so we do our own video production work, and he does an excellent job. Uh, so we try to do more of that. Uh, in terms of like our niche and how we're, we're building, so obviously nursing education we've always been known for. I, I feel like we should be the largest education program in the state. So uh, even though we're known for education, we need to be much larger to meet the school districts. Need. So we do intend to develop out uh, more specialized programs, like early childhood, uh, special education, uh, more into the STEM fields, more into technology. Uh, we need to train, train teachers to be able to teach in an online environment. No one does that now. Uh, so we're looking at, at that just within the School of Education itself. Deaf studies is another critical area that we feel like needs to be filled, and speech pathology. So we're looking at starting our first master's in speech pathology within uh, one year, maybe two. Uh, at the max. Um, so we're building out in all of those areas. Uh, we've become uh, very recognized for our biology program, pre-medicine. Um, we have uh, four cadaver labs. Uh, we teach with uh, MDs, DOs. Uh, it's very intentional to build toward pharmacy school, medical school, veterinary school. Uh, it's an excellent program. We have a high percentage of, of graduates go on uh, to graduate study in, in the medicine or uh, the other fields. And uh, we're placing students at some of the top programs in the country. We place one student uh, in one of the top five vet programs, one of the top five pharmacy programs. Um, so we're starting to get traction in terms of the quality of the education uh, that we have. Our business program has an entrepreneur track. That's another one that we're pursuing. Our criminal justice program is one of the largest. I could go, you know, talk about a number of different niche areas that we're creating. But the idea behind all of this is to identify how can we best prepare our students for a workplace that they need. 
And for example, we just started communications with the public relations emphasis degree. Again, recognizing that that's a big area in the valley uh, to be ongoing need for uh, people with those public relations skills. Just a few of them. We have time for one more question. Oh, one, one thing first, sorry. Bart's not giving credit though. Bart knows how to integrate with the students in a way to get them, new students to college, to get out and let their family and friends and people know what they're experiencing at state. Um, he does have a great social media side to the campus and involvement of the students because they're the best marketers without a doubt. It's more of a statement than a question actually. The experience we've had today in the conference, we're here at a planning conference, students are coming to our table saying, you want to know more about what you're doing? Yeah. Like, that <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right, with that, I'd like to thank our panel this afternoon. <laughs> City of Henderson and Dan Walker with Light Power. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. My pleasure. And we'll bring you back up to close same time. John. Uh, John, thank you so much. Uh, Bart, Stephanie, and uh, Cam, thank you very much for a very interesting and informative panel. We really appreciate it. Um, so before we let you go to, to join into your sessions for the rest of the afternoon, um, John mentioned it in, in uh, the discussion, but just to make sure, at 2 o'clock, um, you heard about the master plan for Nevada State College. Go experience it. There's the art walk that Angela's leading um, starting at 2. Uh, please meet in the atrium uh, across the, the quad there. We could start from here if that's more convenient for everybody. Anyone who's interested in the art walk, would you like to depart from here? Yes. Um, she, just, she actually needed to check some video for today. She'll be right back. So 2 o'clock. So, yeah, here, maybe 155. Um, gather here in this room and, and uh, head out. Or I gave you the quarter room. So uh, we really appreciate you being here, and please go enjoy the rest of the afternoon.